Amen. Wel, so Tanny Belma het vir al die moeders een geskenkie gekry, so al die moeders kan maar staan, waar is hulle allemaal? <laughs> Klim uit jou kar uit, staan al langs jou kar. Ons gaan een bid vir die moeders. <laughs> Ik denk nee, dat de ma is zo so speciaal. Ik denk dat zo so bij een keer besef van ook niet hoe een moeders hart uh, is. Ik kijk net partij maar naar Rudai en dan zie ik hoe zij voor die kinders alles zal doen. Zij zal alle haasten geven, zij zal opstaan in die ochtend vijf uur. Ik kan niet opkrijgen van mij om iets te doen vijf uur ochtend die maar voor die kinders. Zal zij vijf uur opstaan? Nee, dat zij zelf voor mij. Hij <laughs> weet, het is zo so wonderlijk. Kom ons deel vir hulle uit, dan gaan ons het vir hulle lekker bid, kom ons gee hulle handen klap. Dankie Heere vir moeders, amen. Hulle is wonderlik. Dankie Tanny Velma vir die moeite. Ek weet nou nie of, eh, of die vader van die gemeente ook iets krijg. Ons staan in as die maasie daar is hier. Ja, ons staan in as die maasie daar is hier. Amen. Nee, ons wil het vir die mama sê, jylle is speciaal, ons waardeer jylle, my ma ook, as jy daar in series is, sy gaan die video daar kyk, so ma, het is lief vir ma, waardeer ma, en uh, ma is a blessing, altyd wijsheid, altyd so iemand na wie toe mens kan gaan as jy wil praat, sy luister altyd, en sy het altyd, sy probeer altyd al best om een mens net weer te help, mens, een ma het nie altyd al die woorde nie, weet nie altyd wat om te sê nie, maar sy is net daar, Jy weet, en dis wat so speciaal is, en dis al wat ons nodig het somtijds, dis net iemand wat jou verstaan, wat in jou glo, al glo niemand anders in jou nie, jou ma sal jou lief he. Jou ma is jou lief. Amen, kom ons bid vir die moeders. Vader, ons kom met die toe in Jesus naam. En vader, ons dankie vir elke moeder vandag. Heer, ons dankie dat jy vir ons hierdie gift gegeet. Thanks that jy was born. Father, thank you that you gave the command, said, be fruitful and multiply. And Father, we thank you that we can come today and we can thank you for mothers because they are precious. Father, we thank you that they have a heart. You've given them an ability to nurse, ability to, to nest, an ability to, to, to just take care, Father, and we thank you. No matter how strong we as men sometimes are, no matter what we do, we will always fall into the arms of a mother, arms of a wife, arms of a woman. And we thank you, Father, that you've given us this gift of woman. Your word says you find a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And Father, we thank you for the wisdom in woman today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give it a clap. Amen. All right. Okay, so we've been speaking about the Holy Spirit and the anointing actually and, and as I've been showing you over the last few weeks that the anointing and the Holy Spirit, actually the Holy Spirit is the one that brings the anointing. The Holy Spirit is the one that is the anointing because it's the presence of God. In the old days only the prophets and the priests and the kings were anointed. They were the only ones that carried the anointing. They carried the Spirit of God. But today God is moving upon His church. And we said to you last time, we were looking at 1 John 2 verse 27. I'm just going to read it real quick. But as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction which you receive from Him abides permanently in you. And we know that this is the Holy Spirit. So then you have no need that anyone should instruct you but just as his anointing teaches you concerning everything, and we really read that in John chapter 13, 14, 16, you can read all the characteristics of the Spirit, that is the paracletos, the comforter, the helper, the one who comes alongside, the one who guides him to all truth, and it's so powerful when you look at that. He says, his anointing teaches you concerning everything, and is true and is not falsehood. So you must abide in, and last time I spoke about this, I said you must abide in, live in, never depart from Him, being rooted in Him, knit to Him, just as His anointing has taught you to do. Now, uh, I said last time that the anointing teaches us about God. The anointing is the one that uh, we should have a relationship with, with the Holy Spirit, we should have a relationship. And that relationship, because it is a three-in-one 
uh, when you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you have a relationship with the Father, you have a relationship with the Son. So uh, it's so powerful uh, when we see that. And, and, and so we need to be knit to Him, built into Him, have a relationship with Him. So it's so important because that is what will increase the anointing in your life. The anointing is the manifest presence of God. That will increase the manifest presence of your uh, of God in your life. It will increase an experience with, with God. It will increase your prayer life. When you pray, you will experience Him. When you minister, you will experience Him. When you speak, His presence will come and it will fill a place or it will touch people's lives. So it's so important that we need that manifest presence of the Spirit wherever we go because that is what moves and heals the sick raise the dead casts out demons it's anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage says the bible and that is because of the presence of the lord manifesting through your life so let's just pray father we just thank you this morning and holy spirit this morning as i speak about you and your anointing i pray that you will come and that you will touch us that you will come and reveal it to us father in my own knowledge this morning we struggle with the sound or whatever lord but i pray that right now you will just bring to remembrance what we've dealt with me last night what you what you gave me last night in jesus name help me to bring it forth to release it this morning in jesus name amen the bible says in 1 corinthians 2 verse 16 and we looked at this last week for who has known that understood the mind and the counsels and purposes of the Lord as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? He says, but we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts, the feelings, and the purposes of his heart. Remember I spoke about that last time? So this morning I just want to show you some of the characteristics of someone that's anointed. You know, and we, when we look in the Bible, we can look at that in kings and uh, we can see it in the first samuel actually we we look in the king's lives that were anointed and two of the kings that the bible prominently speaks about was king saul and his anointing and, and king david and his anointing and then in between all that was samuel as well which was a prophet so i'm just going to bring a little bit of a comparison or out of their lives i just want to give you some things like quickly want to try and go through that because last night the Lord woke me up at one o'clock and I said to Rude last night, I felt like I don't have what I want to speak on yet. I don't understand yet. I, it's as if I can't grasp this thing about the anointing and the Holy Spirit. It's as if I cannot grasp it yet. I don't have what I need to give. And I'm waiting on the Lord, you know, and I fasted yesterday and I trusted the Lord. And I said, Lord, I want you to speak. Holy Spirit, I want you. Anointing, come and work and speak and do what you want to do. I don't want to come with a message of another man. I don't want to come with someone else's revelation. You must speak to me. I want to know you. I want to reveal you to the people. And last night at one o'clock, the Lord woke me up and I started opening up my Bible. I didn't want to. Uh, uh, read or nothing but I just started getting my tablet washed my face and I got into the word and God started downloading into my spirit now I just want to quickly look at some things about kings now David Samuel and Saul uh, Samuel was a prophet David was a king Saul was a king I want to start with Moses first of all uh, the Bible, Bible says in Acts 20 verse 19 they didn't want to hear God's voice anymore and I want to bring that to you this morning you know that God's design was never to have a king his design was never to have prophets his design was never he wanted to speak to people himself he wanted to have a relationship with us himself and we saw with Moses the first time they kind of rejected the voice of God. The Bible says, and when all the people, Exodus 20 verse 19, and when all the people, verse 18, witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the ram's horn and the mountain enveloped with smoke, they trembled and stood at a distance. So they trembled, they were in fear, and they stood at a distance, says the Bible. Speak to us yourself and we will listen, they said to Moses. But do not let God speak to us 
or we will die. Wow. So they said to Moses, listen to what the people are saying. They said to Moses, don't, don't let God speak to us. You speak to us yourself because if he speaks to us, we will die. And they kind of rejected God speaking to them. They wanted a mediator. They wanted someone to stand in the gap and speak on their behalf to God and for God to speak through a man to them on, on his behalf. You know, and so we see this in the Bible, and this is kind of a thing that Israel did. This is a kind of a thing that we still see today that we do not want to, uh, uh, people don't want to commune with God by themselves. That's why we struggle to pray. We struggle to spend time in His presence. You see, because when you come into His presence, like Moses, there is thunders and lightnings. There is a fear that comes upon you. There's a humbling that comes into your spirit. There's something that God does in the, on the inside of you that changes you. It, 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 it saturates you. There was a song that one guy once sang, just one glimpse of his glory, just one touch of his hand, and I will never be the same again. You see, because when you come into the presence of God, you are changed. You cannot stay the same. You see, and that's why they didn't want that, because people in their hearts sometimes don't want to change. When especially if you don't know Jesus, if you're not saved, you don't want to change. You want to live the way that you live. Sometimes we struggle in surrendering our lives for His life. We're struggling in giving up our own lives and saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And we need to change that stinking thinking. One, uh, I think Rodney Howard Brown says that we need to change our stinking thinking. And we need to come to a place where you say, Lord, I want to come into your presence. I want to feel you. I will go where the thunders and lightnings. And, and I know that in the presence of God, it's not thunders and lightnings always. Because the Bible says he wasn't in the wind with Elijah. He wasn't in the storm, but he was in a still small voice. And I know when you really come to God, he will speak to you in a still small voice. Last night, as God spoke to me, I was just lying in my bed. I couldn't stand up and walk around and disturb everyone. That's how I pray. I'll just turn on my side and I'll just lie there because otherwise I must concentrate on my walking while I'm praying. I must concentrate on my kneeling and my knees that I saw while I'm praying. But for me, I just turn on my side and I close my eyes and I commune with God. I just spend time in His presence in my bed. I spend time because I don't want anything. I lie on my blanket. I'm not, we don't have to be religious or come with all kinds of religious acts before the Lord. God seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, and I came and I lied in my bed and I was just speaking to the Lord and God was sharing stuff with me. And as I was lying there, the tears started running. And, and I had to turn around and take my tablet and just make some notes and turn around again. And as I just thought, now I'm going to sleep, then it starts again. And I had to turn around and put stuff in my tablet and I had to turn around and sleep again. And I was lying next to her day and tears were running and I was crying. And sometimes I felt like I just went like... <laughs> and I didn't want her to wake her, you know, because I just felt the presence of God. And I want to tell you that that is how God wants to meet with us. He wants to meet with you like you would not know. He wants to spend time with you like you would not know. If you don't experience it. And God is so awesome. You know, it's not thunders and lightnings. It's beautiful. The Bible says, so they didn't want to hear the voice of God. And they said, speak to us yourself. But let, let you speak to us, no, do not let God speak to us. Do not be afraid, Moses replied, for God has come to test you, so that the fear of Him may be before you to keep uh, you from sinning. You see, when you come in the presence of God, it's not the fear of the Lord that causes you not to sin. In the Old Testament, it was the fear of the Lord. They needed the fear of the Lord. In the Old Covenant, they bring the fear of the Lord. You shall do this. You shall do that. If you do not do this, then this and this and that will happen. 
in the New Testament, it's the love of God that draws you to repentance. Let me tell you, you will experience the love of God. He will saturate you with His love and His love will draw you. You would want to be in His presence and not go out of His presence because of that love that surrounds you. Listen to what the Bible talks about uh, how the first time the people went and they said, Lord, give us a king. And they, uh, God didn't want them to have a king because He wanted to have a relationship with them. But listen, 1 Samuel 8 verse 4 to 20, I want to do this quickly. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So they wanted a king like all the other nations did. And so many times we want what other people want. And that is what I want to teach you. My main message this through this whole anointing series. Don't always want what other people want. Say, Lord, come and touch me. I've got a special anointing. There's something unique about you. And you must say, Lord, come and teach me who you are for me. I want to experience you for me. And I want to worship you like only I can. Because no one else can touch his heart like you. Amen. It's about a relationship. So they said, Lord, like all the other nations have, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have do, uh, done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have brought them, uh, which, which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their, to their voice. However, you shall solemnly for, uh, forewarn them and show them the behavior of a king who will reign over them. So he says, if they're rejecting you like they rejected me. So hear their voice. Give them what they want. You know, this is the God that we serve. If you want to me to speak to God on your behalf, He will do that. If He wants you to have a mediator in that place, He will do that. He said, give them what they want. And so many times we do not want to have that, uh, I don't know why, but it's like we just don't want to step in that relationship with Him. Because it's going to require of us to change. It's going to require of us to come into His full character. It's going to require of us to let down and lay down some of the stuff that we have in our own lives. And that's what it's going to mean because when you start walking into the presence of God, when you start coming into the presence of God, it's more glorious, it's more powerful, it's more, uh, you, you cannot describe it to people because His presence is so powerful that you would want to be like Him. We are created in His image and likeness. There's something inside of you that's always hungering for where it comes from. That's why when you die, your body will, will, will go to the earth because it comes from the earth. And when you die, your soul and your spirit will go to God because it comes from God. He breathed into Adam and let himself into his body. And he fell and he fell and he added a distorted uh, self. But on the day of Pentecost and when we accept Jesus, he breathes on us again. He fills us with his spirit. He saturates us. He makes us new. And we want to go back to where we come from. There's something in you that desires God more than what you know. When I preached in the street, there were some times when I could feel people crying out to the Lord, but they didn't know that their spirit and their hearts were crying out to God. That's why people are searching for God in all kinds of things. I must keep on with my word. I'm talking about stuff. Forgive me. <laughs> but you know, so the Bible says that they turned. And they said, give us a king. And the Bible said to, uh, to, to Samuel, but tell them what a king would want. Tell them how a king will rule over them. 
Because it's not God's design to have a king. And listen to what the Lord said to them, the king, uh, the king, Samuel told them. He said, this will be the behavior of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and his harvests and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots he will take your daughters to be perfumers cooks and bakers he will take the best of your fields your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants he will he will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give them in his uh, to his officers as uh, 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 and servants and he will take your male servants your female servants your finest young men your donkeys and put them in his work he will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants and you will cry out in that day because of your king who you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you that day. Wow. That sounds like a church sometimes. Where we build our lives around a pastor. We build our lives around a minister. It takes your tithes. It takes your best. Your children go into the ministry. Whatever it might be. This was never God's plan. His intent was to know Him. And if I say this this morning, and when I preach about this, and when I see this every time, I say, Trevor, you must be careful. Now everyone says, no, I'm not going to go to church anymore because the king is going to take this, and the king is going to take that. <laughs> but that's not the case, because the God has given us a new covenant, and He's raised up the fivefold ministry. We are not judges. We are not kings. We are not priests. We are not one of those things. We are fivefold ministry to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And therefore, we do not need all those things, because God must take care of us. And yes, we do the principle of the tithe, and you do the principle of giving, so that the house of the Lord will not have lack, so that we can build and plant and move forward. And whatever you give is given into the ministry so that we can grow so that's a new testament principle but god's plan was never for them to have someone else rule over them because he wanted to rule over them himself they just came out of the judges that took control and did things the judges were more or less i don't know maybe more like the fivefold ministry they saw a problem and they started moving and did something for the lord they didn't need an appointment they didn't need anyone to tell them to do it there was something the spirit of the lord came upon them the lord called them and they started moving in power and that is what we as believers should be doing as well ask god the bible says desire spiritual gifts the desire the anointing desire the presence of god now the Bible, Bible talks about Saul uh, as a king. He was the tallest. He was the most handsome in all Israel, says the Bible. So God, first of all, when he looked for the first king, he looked for the taller one. He looked for the most handsome one. It sounds like me, you know. Uh, <laughs> so he looked for the tallest and the most handsome one. And he appointed him as king because people were so focused on beauty. If you see someone beautiful, it's like, wow, I will follow that person. All the girls will run after uh, Franco because he's a cool guy, you know. That's why we appointed him in the youth. <laughs> and all the boys will run after Carla because she's a beautiful girl. <laughs> That's why we put her in the youth. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, so, so many times we as people will follow beautiful. We will follow the tallest, the strongest. But that's how, how God sees it. And for me, many times when I look at the life of Saul, it was actually as if God never, he put him there. But just to prove a point that it's not always the most beautiful. It's not always the tallest. It's not all the, always the most handsome that really carries the thing through. So whoever you are, no matter how you look, no matter where you come from, God can use you. That's one thing about the anointing. It's not a respecter of persons. It's a searcher of hearts. The Bible says that um, so Samuel was the tallest 
actually when they called him the first time when the, uh, uh, Samuel brought him to be anoint him as king he actually hid between the boxes and they said where is this man has he come yet has he come yet and the Holy Spirit said to Samuel the prophet no he is hiding between the boxes and they had to bring him out so Saul this handsome guy, the tallest of them all, didn't feel worthy enough. And let me tell you, sometimes when you're anointed, you will not feel worthy enough. You will not feel like you're the best. You're the man of power for the hour. Let me tell you, when, once you feel that you're the man of power for the hour, that is the sure sign that you're not. That's the sure sign that you're not. Because God will not choose the prideful. And he saw at the end of his life, it was pride that got him uh, uh, out of the way. It was pleasing men because he wanted to make the offer because people were leaving him. And he wanted to be famous. He wanted to be good. He wanted to be the man. And then he made the offer himself. He stepped, stepped into the place of the priest, of the prophet. And he did the offering himself. And that was what taught the kingdom away from him. You see, so it's not always the strongest, it's not always the most beautiful, but we saw with Saul, he was humble, but he ended up in pride. When the woman was singing, David, uh, King Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands, he was angry. He, uh, he was angry with David and when the anointing left him, you see the anointing left him. And the Bible says that he took a spear and he wanted to kill David. He threw him with a spear because of the jealousy that was in him. And then there's, uh, so uh, yes, and the Spirit of the Lord came on Saul in power. I'm just lifting out some, some of this stuff. Uh, 1 Samuel 11 verse 6, when Saul heard the words, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he burned with great anger. Wow, so the Spirit of the Lord brought anger forth. Wow. You know, so the Bible says that was when, they they, uh, they they came and they said to Gibeah, they said to, uh, I think it's Benjamin's tribe, they said to, they wanted to make a treaty with the king. And the king said, yes, we can do that, but I want to gash out every right eye of every uh, man to, to humiliate the, the Israelites. Then he will make a treaty with them and he will not attack them. And then they went to Saul and they sent messages and they said, but king, this man was said that they want to gash out our eyes. And the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord came on Saul in power. And in the anger of his spirit, he cut the bull in, in, in pieces. And he sent it to every tribe of Israel, all the tri tribes. And he said, You better gather here tomorrow because we are attacking this king. And they came out of fear. They came because the fear of the Lord fell upon them. You see, when you're anointed, sometimes you will speak something and it will happen as you say it. When you're anointed by God, you will carry a, an anointing to speak some things in existence. The anger of the Lord came upon him. It, the Bible, this translation says it rushed upon him. Another translation, it came upon him. So God will come upon you in power. And that's where we sometimes see with the gifts of the Spirit. Where the gift comes upon you. It just fills you. It just suddenly it's just there that word of knowledge. It's just there that gift of faith to heal the sick or whatever. But it's not like it was in the Old Testament. I, I also believe it's that still small voice. Alright. And then we look at David. David was anointed at a young age. He wasn't the strongest. He wasn't the most beautiful. He wasn't, he was even looked over. They didn't even see him. Uh, the, 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 his dad went and Jesse went and he brought all the other sons before the prophet. When Samuel went to anoint him. He didn't even think David worthwhile calling him. First of all, he was too young. Secondly, he was... Uh, Rudy, it says, I don't know where Rudy's name come from, maybe it's that Rudy. I was a big sprinter, a big royal. <laughs> you know, the Bible says he was Rudy, and, 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 but he was a handsome young man. And then he was tending the sheep. He was out in the field doing what he does. 
You see, sometimes God will call you when you keep on doing what you do and you do it well. Because sometimes what you do in the natural is what God sees. Sometimes your lifestyle in the natural is what touches the heart of God. And that is what makes Him call you. Jeremiah says, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, I set you apart. God gives you characteristics that He can look upon later and say, I want to take this person. He has been growing up in my anointing. He's been growing up in my, uh, what I created in Him. And David was a worshiper. He was sitting in a field playing his harp and singing songs, singing hymns and spiritual songs. You know, he was singing unto the Lord. He was a worshiper. And that is what touched the heart of God. Because he touched the heart of God. He, when everyone else and even the prophet overlooked him, God saw him. You see, and when you're anointed, God will see you. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord is searching the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to Him, so that He can powerfully assist them. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9. You know, and, and God's eyes is constantly looking and searching for someone that He can pour His anointing upon. He can pour His Spirit out on Him. He can fill Him with His very presence in the new covenant. He can saturate him. He can become himself inside of you. Amen. David didn't fight in Saul's armor. He said, I've killed the lion and the bear. He didn't fight in another man's calling, another man's uh, way of doing things. He had his own way. And that was the simple way with a slingshot. He killed the lion and the bear. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? And he went. Saul wanted to put his armor on him. And he said, no, I cannot move. This is not my way. It's not the way I do it. And he threw the armor off him. And he went to the river and he picked five smooth stones. And he took his slingshot and his little skirt like we always see him in the in the uh, 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 children's Bible <laughs> with his little bag and his stones and he went and he went against the giant and he killed him he slayed him in his way you see there's something special about you that God can use that he can anoint that he can use and that made David a mighty warrior further on in his life the anointing was upon him Saul could see that the anointing was upon David that's why he became jealous and he wanted to kill him um, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. You know, and I, when I thought about that, actually this morning, the Lord showed me this. Why was David? There were so many reasons why David was a man after God's own heart. I think, first of all, he was a worshiper. He worshiped God. He was repentant. When he made a mistake, he was repentant. But you know what? I think David had love. He had so much love inside of him. When he was at the cave of Adullam and everyone was, uh, 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 Saul was looking for him, trying to kill him. David was in the cave and the Bible says, and all the distressed and all the, uh, uh, um, the, the debtors, the Bible says, uh, 1 Samuel 22 verse 2, and all who were distressed and indebted or dis discontented railed around, rallied around him and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. Eventually, they were 600 men and they became the mighty men of valor with David from that cave. The distressed, the debtors, the people that were kind of cast out, the ones that uh, kind of rebelled or whatever against the government or whatever. They were the ones that came to David and David took them and he changed them because I believe that he loved people. He looked at people and he loved them. You see, in David's sin, but he recovered. The Bible says in Psalms 51 and verse 10 to 13, and this was David's prayer, and I think David saw, I saw, when the Spirit of God left him, how an evil spirit came and tormented him. The Spirit sent from God, says the Bible, went and tormented Saul. Are you guys still with me? Yes. And that Spirit tormented him. And the Bible says that, he saw how Saul changed. He saw he, how he became an angry man. He saw how he took a spear and wanted to kill him. 
how he wanted to do revenge. He saw the jealousy that was upon him. And that touched David. You see, because if you're anointed, you learn from the mistakes of others. You see what others do and you learn from it. You look at it and you say, Lord, help me. And you know, not prideful, I will never do that. You will walk in humility and say, Lord, please help me. I do not want to be like that. I do not want to end up like that. That is a prayer in my life many times. I say, Lord, I do not want to end up like this or that or this one or that one. And David prayed a prayer. Psalms 51 verse 10 to 13. Because he saw that, he knew that he said, Create in me a pure heart, O God. A pure heart. David had a pure heart and he longed for a pure heart. He said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I think in other translation, renew a right spirit within me. Renew a steadfast that I will be constant. That I will not be like the wind changing and shifting all the time. That I will be constant, steadfast. Created me a clean heart, says another translation, and renew a right spirit within me, that my spirit will always be right with you. That it will no, be no sin or nothing that will take me away from you, and then I must make right again. I will always want to be right before you. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. That's what he saw with Saul. He said, Lord, do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit away from me. Because he knew that he was dependent on the anointing. He knew that he was dependent on the presence of God. And if you're a child of God, you need to grow that dependence on the Holy Spirit in your preaching. You need to build that dependence on the Holy Spirit in your business. You need to build that dependence on the Holy Spirit in everything that you do. Because it's the only thing David knew. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. He wanted to be in his presence. His grace this longing was the presence of the Lord. You see, because when you have the anointing, like in the old days, they had the presence of the Lord. The prophets would sit in the desert in the presence of the Lord. The kings and the priests will be in the presence of the Lord when, the, when they stand with the sacrifices and the presence of the Lord will come upon them so they could not stand. That presence was valuable. You see, let the value, let the presence of God be your most valuable thing in this day. He says, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He says, restore, renew, restore to me. Create it again, bring it back. After he felt with Bathsheba, I think, or whatever it might have been. He said, Lord, just do not take your spirit away from me. Do whatever you want to. God took his firstborn child that he got with Bathsheba. But he said, Lord, do whatever you want, but take not your spirit away from me. I do not want to end up like Saul. I do not want to be like Saul. Take not your spirit away from me. He said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Your salvation, not my salvation. I would say, restore to me the joy of my salvation. But he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation because you saved me. You are the one that brought me into this relationship. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. That I will be joyful in what you've done for me. That I will be joyful in your presence. That I will be joyful because you have anointed me. Because you've touched me. Because you want to use me. Please, Lord, take not your spirit away from me. Can you see the heart of David? I believe that is why he was a man after God's own heart. He desired God more than anything else in his life. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. Sustain me. A willing spirit. Lord, that I will be willing to do your will. Whatever you ask, I will do it. Sustain me. Lord, I cannot be without your sustenance, without you sustaining me. I will fall away, I will be poor, I will be bankrupt if you do not sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will come back 
will turn back to you. And listen to his heart. This, this is such a New Testament last verse. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. That was the fivefold ministry also kind of in that thing unfolding. He said, teach, uh, I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Amen. I will teach them your ways so that sinners. He had a heart for souls. He said, Lord, I will teach them your way so that sinners will turn back to you. He wanted, like he said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Lord, I want to restore unto people that joy of your salvation. I want to bring them back into your presence. It's powerful. And then the Bible talks about Samuel the prophet. Now, Samuel is not much to say. Samuel anointed all these kings, these two kings. He was righteous in all his ways. He was such a powerful. They actually said that Samuel was one of the most powerful prophets in the, in the Bible. Samuel was one of the greatest prophets. You know, in Samuel, you see the kings and you see the anointing on the kings. And then you see Samuel, which to me is a type and a shadow of the end time generation. Even though they were kings and they did all these mighty wars and everything, there was always a prophet Samuel. When they did wrong, he came and he said, hey, what are you doing? You have sinned against the Lord. And he will take uh, 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 people and, and the, the king that Saul saved and he killed him with the sword. He will come and bring the righteous judgment of God. He will set things in order. And that's kind of the spirit that should be upon us as well. So he grew up in the temple. Samuel grew up in the temple. Uh, he was dedicated to God by his mother Hannah. You see, we need to dedicate our children to the Lord. Say, Lord, here is my child. Take this child. You see that dedication that you do when we stand in church and you dedicate your child to the Lord. It's actually a very powerful thing. Because you're giving that child to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is your child. Suddenly that child comes under the anointing, comes under the spirit, comes under the protection of God, comes under the will of God. God knows that child from the day that it's born. Suddenly that child is given to God and God takes that child and he guides that child through his life and he carries it. Sorry, I, I must finish. So Samuel walked in the character of God. Amen. The Bible says 1 Peter 2 verse 4 and verse 12 that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Today we must, must realize that the king, we are a royal priesthood. We have the same royalty as kings. We are a priesthood and we are to prophesy. We have a prophetic anointing like a Samuel that comes upon us. I don't want to go and read that 1 Peter 2 verse 4 to 12, go and read it. So we must realize that in the New Testament, we are a royal priesthood. We carry the anointings that kings carry. We carry the anointing that priests carry. It is in us. So powerful. The Bible says in Acts 2 and verse 16, but instead of this, the beginning of what was spoken through the prophet Joel in Amplified, it says, And I shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass in the last days, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, uh, tell forth the divine counsels, says the Amplified. You will tell forth the divine counsels. It all lines up with what we were reading in Corinthians and in First John. He says, uh, and shall come to pass in the last days, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You see, I believe that the end time generation is going to be, and since Jesus, he has been raising up a prophetic generation. A Samuel generation. A people that are righteous in all their ways. A people led by the spirit that does the will of God. A prophetic generation that we should speak forth the counsels of his of the, the forth the divine counsels and your young men sh shall see visions divinely granted uh, uh, appearances your young men will see visions divinely granted appearances 
Uh, and then he says, all men will dream dreams upon both men and women. <coughs> Not just men, he says, both men and women. New Testament. Both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. All of us. Amen. So powerful. 1 John 2 verse 27 that I read in the beginning. It says, but... Uh, uh, later on in the scripture it says but just as his anointing teaches you concerning everything and is true and is no falsehood so you must abide in live in never depart from hide begin rooted in him being rooted in him knit to him just as his anointing teaches you and the things that the lord woke me up this morning i want to end with that God started speaking to me. Bible, God said to me, it has always been about us and Him. It's never about a king. It's not about a priest. God said to me, it's always been about us and Him. A relationship. Samuel, Saul, David. I just wrote some things down. I just want to read it. Elijah, Elisha. Whoever was what he wanted with us all. That was what he wanted with us all. The relationship that he had with Elijah, with Moses, with David, with Samuel. That is what he wanted with us. Moses was his friend, <laughs> says the Bible. He met with him on the mountain, but he was his friend. Moses could cry out to God, Lord, save these people. And he could say, Lord, kill them all. And God would say, no, wait, wait. And there were times that God would say, I'm going to kill them all. And Moses will come in and say, wait, wait, don't kill them. What are people going to say if you do that? What a powerful relationship. Bible says God created man in his own image. He created us in his own image. And that's what I the Lord spoke to me this with him. And then man also felt they wanted something that they could love. And God gave him Eve. Her object of love. As we are God's object of love, so Eve was Adam's object of love. Someone that he could hold, someone that he could hug. Someone that he could speak to, someone that he could sit by on the street at night or wherever. It was a relationship. It's always about us and him. And I just saw that. Jesus wants a bride. Because God wanted us as his people, an object that he could show his love to. And we see that theme right through the Bible. Jesus wanted a bride and we are that bride an object of his love Jesus wants to love you when I take her day many times I will lie next to her in bed and just feel her maybe just rub her face I'll put my hand over her face and just go like that in the beginning she always but I will do that at night sometimes I'll just touch her because I just want to Whenever I feel alone, I want it. This morning she came and she said, Oh, last night, can I pack my clothes in the cupboard while I was preparing a little bit? And she said to me, Am I going to disturb you? And I said to her, No, you know I always want you close to me. I don't care, just be close to me. Anyone else can, will disturb me, but she will never disturb me. She can always be around me. She can always be where I am. She can always be like Emma in the kitchen, standing in my way. She will be in my way, but I will love her because then I can touch her. I can hug her because I want her close. You see, that's how God wants a relationship with you. You will never be in this way. Even when you sleep, He wants to touch you. 
and wake you up and tell you about His love. What an awesome God we serve. The greatest feeling and releasing agent of the anointing is love. That's what God said to me this morning. It's all about love. You see, the real anointing is released when there's love. Real anointing flows when there's love. When you speak about God and you love Him and tears start running down your eyes, there's an anointing because love has arrived. God is love. He is love. You see, when you experience love, when a sick person comes into a place, that song, the healers in the room, there's a, uh, on the video there's a place in that song where the leper comes into the crowd and everyone stands back and the guy playing Jesus walks forward and he's got this soft look in his eyes and he goes to this man and everyone stands back and he goes and he puts his hands on this man's broken, sore face covered with cloths and stuff. He puts his hands on him and in love he just wipes it down his face. And as he brings his hands down, the healing comes. You see, it's the love of God that releases the anointing. If you cannot love people, you will not carry the anointing. If you don't, do, not, do not love the people of God, you will never carry the anointing. If you cannot walk in perfect love, the Bible says perfect love drives out all fear. The enemy cannot be where there is love. Fear will move. Fear of sickness, fear of death. That's why when you preach the gospel and you preach it out of love, people are drawn to it because it's the love of God that draws them to repentance. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and He healed the sick. Wherever He went, it's the love. You know, when God anointed the king, when King Saul heard that they wanted to gouge out the eyes of the men, Love fold him. These are my people. They are not going to do that to my people. They are part of the tribes of Israel. And anger came over him. An anger of love. And the anointing came over him. And he started moving. He took a bull and he cut it into pieces. And he says, you will be here tomorrow. And the fear of the Lord came upon him. And he, they moved. You see, love releases the power. That's what God was speaking to me this morning. True love is tangible. Where there's love, you will feel it. We talk about the anointing is the manifest presence of God. True love is tangible. When Carla and Frank, we sit next to one another in the classes or wherever we are, and when we speak, they're a good example because they married young. They will sit there and I will say something and Carla will tug her arms in under him and say, and you will just see the love. You can see it. We've got a couple living in our building. They never touch one another. They never speak to one another. They just, he sits on the stoop and she's in the house lying on the couch look, watching movies. I don't know if they, I, I think they're brother and sister. <laughs> because they never speak to one another. You see, but where there's love, there's relationship. Where there's love, there's, you don't care what that person does. You love them unconditionally. True love, agape love, is unconditional. I wrote here, true love is tangible. You can feel it. Do you know that? You can feel it. I know when I see her day and when I touch her, I can feel something move inside of me. Amen? True love is tangible. It is felt and experienced. It affects your whole spirit, soul, and body. <laughs> True love, you can experience it. It affects your whole soul, spirit, and body. Everything about you is touched when there's love. When I fell in love for the first time, I was awake. It was like every sense of me. I couldn't go to bed. I couldn't go to sleep. I was thinking about it. And at first, I didn't really love her that much, but when I fell in love, nothing could take it away from me. It was supernatural. So if you want to talk about supernatural, 
It's the love of God that brings the supernatural. The true anointing is the love of God because God is love. It makes you want to do. And the Bible says the anointing is the unction to function. It's that thing that moves you to action. You see, in the love of God, is, it will make you move. It will bring you to action. You would want to do something about it. That's why the judges were the most powerful leaders. Because they wanted to do something. Shantai loves her mother. And this morning she got up at uh, 1 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Yeah, at 5 she did the first thing. But at 1 o'clock I was awake. And I heard her in the kitchen and she was preparing everything, packing all her stuff ready because she was going to bake her mom pancakes this morning. Uh, waffles, or what do you call it? Flapjacks. <laughs> With syrup and she bought some jam yesterday. She's been planning it all the time. True love will bring action. You know, it's the unction to function. That is the purest form of the anointing. And I said that is love. Yes. The Bible says that we were called to show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And that's why I want to be in the fivefold ministry, is to show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, if we as ministers will walk in the love of God, we will see the power of God. I have an expectation. God's given me this revelation. And it's always been my prayer. I remember when I was in Bible school, I'm finishing. For hours I laid on my carpet. For hours I prayed. Five hours at a time. And I said, Lord, created me love. Last night when I was lying on my bed, I was crying because the Lord reminded me how I prayed for love. And that should be our prayer. If you want to be anointed, you need to have the love of God in your heart. Like David said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O oh God, renew you a right spirit, spirit of love within me. Cast me not from your presence, O oh Lord, because he knew that God was love. He didn't want to walk out of that love. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning. And Father, I pray right now. I know I've spoken long this morning. I know that I, I've lost some people maybe along the way. But Lord, I pray that you will come with the power of your Holy Spirit. And that you will teach us this principle. The characteristic of the anointing is love. The power of the anointing is love. And Father, because God is love and being in your presence will change us into people of love. And that will increase the anointing. That will let the Holy Spirit flow because Jesus was moved with compassion. And Father, I thank you this morning that you will release that in our hearts and in our spirits. In Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to give an opportunity if there's anyone, maybe online you're listening to this message and you need Jesus in your life and you want to come and give your life to the Lord. You want to enter His fold and come into this place of love. Maybe your heart has been crying out to the Lord. Your spirit has been sinking. You have been broken. You have been hurt. Let me tell you there's no greater love than the love of God. It's the love of God that will draw you, will change you, bring you to repentance. And if you are here this morning and you're listening to this voice or afternoon or evening, whenever you're listening and you need Jesus in your life and you say, Pastor Trevor, pray for me. I need Jesus. I want to experience this love. I've been hated. I've been rejected. I felt like I'm not worth it. But this morning I know that God loves me. He wants to have a relationship with me. I do not want the king. I do not want a priest. I want to have a relationship with him. And this morning I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to the Lord. Wherever you are, wherever you are standing, even right now in this area, if you hear my voice and you want to give your life to the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity to make a choice this morning and come into the presence of God. Come into that relationship with a loving Heavenly Father that cares for you. 
Right now, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want you to pray that prayer after me. It's unto uh, salvation that we confess. We confess Jesus as Lord because He's the only way to the Father. The Bible says no one can come to the Father except through the Son. He is the door and He keeps on knocking. And you need to come this morning and knock on His door and say, Lord, come in, enter my life, enter my heart. I'm going to pray a prayer and I want you to pray after me. And everyone here, just pray it after me. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I ask you, come and touch my life. Come and fill me with you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That He died for me. And this morning I repent. I ask you forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Save me. And this morning, Lord Jesus, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, I believe that you are the Son of God and you died for me. Amen. If you listen to this, this message, this message this morning, if you gave your life to the Lord, you need to find a church. Find a place where you can grow in God. Find a place where you can know Him more. Find a place where you can experience His love, where you can come into His presence. This is your day. Come and seek Him. Come and find Him. And even in your room, wherever you are, He wants to speak to you. Just start speaking to Him. And He will touch you. He will touch you. He will change you. And you will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. Wherever you are, there's sickness in your body. Put your hand on yourself right now. If you're sitting next to one, someone you know that there's sickness in, your bo in their body, put your hand upon them right now. Even if they don't want you to, put your hand upon them. Because God wants to touch them. It's the love of God that's in this place this morning. And He wants to touch you. He wants to heal you. I'm starting this. Father, right now we come to you in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that you are the healer. I thank you your word says that by your stripes we are healed. Your word says that you were moved with compassion and you heal their diseases, Father. And Father, I pray right now that you will touch every person, every sickness, every mental condition, every anxiety, every fear. Father, in Jesus' name, I bind you and I curse you in Jesus' name. Every anxiousness, Father, even asthma or asthmatic um, symptoms like with day's chest, Father. Father, I come against it in Jesus' name. Every weapon of the enemy, I cancel it. And Father, right now, I thank you that you touch them, that you heal them, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You still do it the same way because you're still the God of love. You do not want us to be sick. You do not want us to be destroyed. You do not want us to live in poor conditions, but you have come to give us life and life in abundance, life to the full. And right now, I thank you for touching them, healing them, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God.